So, alrighty. Well, I'm going to talk about um, a project that I will be working on. Um, and I want to call this project the Super Dish. Now, last year I wanted to get a Fresnel lens during summer, and it didn't happen. Uh, I was interested in playing around with parabolic solar cookers, uh, and it also didn't happen. Now, these are the ones that are like a dish, and you've got like a focal point, and you've got to put like the pot sort of out a certain distance away, hanging in midair, and that's sort of where your focal point is, and then all of a sudden, yeah, your kettle starts whistling and things start rumbling away, and, you know, um, you get your food cooked. Uh, and it's a lot slower, uh, usually, than normal cooking. Um, now, with all this, um, you know, I could do what some people have done and get a little... Um, one of those pay TV satellite dishes and then sit there waiting for, you know, 14 minutes to cook a few eggs or whatever, um, or a long time waiting for a kettle to boil. I'm not really that way inclined. I've been playing around with this wok lid um, off a wok that my uncle had here. And um, first of all, I thought the wok lid itself might work. No, it was too dull. So then I got um, packets, uh, old packets of uh, crisps or chips as we call them here and sort of sticky tape them, like done those little sticky tape loops to be able to stick that onto the back of, um, you know, to stick it on the um, the wok lid. Anyway, um, that sort of gave me a focal point, but there's still a bit of oil and chips and muck on it, and, and then I had this tissue that had sort of twisted into like a cigar shape and I was holding it there and the wind kept blowing around the damn way all the time so it wasn't getting hot enough to actually catch it on fire but there was a very bright amount of light on it um, in one point there you know which indicated I was getting a focal point without a problem um, it may not have been the best because I think the tape was sort of lumped up a bit and the stuff wasn't perfectly smoothed out and there's a few crinkles in it so but yeah I was getting a focal point um, but you know you wouldn't have been cooking anything off it. Um, now, there's a helicopter that keeps hanging around. I don't know why. Here it comes again. Anyways, um, I'm going to be building the Super Dish, which is not going to be anything very small. It's actually going to be about 16 foot 5 inches across. Yeah, no joke. Um, it's basically five metres across. You know, this is, this is the diameter I'm talking about. 16 foot five or five metres diameter. Um, and my one for the purposes of simplicity, I am going to make a spherical one, which is basically like a ball uh, or half a ball. Um, and that makes it very easy when it comes to mathematics and stuff like that. Um, you know, it'd be nice to make a parabolic one, but I don't really feel like going into the university because I've looked at the formulae for that, and oh my gosh, they're complicated. Um, and I'd have to take a trip to the university, and I don't really feel like it um, because it's easy to work with a uh, circle. And, you know, that will give me a problem known as spherical aberration. And that means that the focal point ain't too great. It isn't really perfectly centred focal point. It's sort of, instead of being a really super bright in a, in a small area like this, it's sort of not as bright and bigger. But when you start looking at it, you know, the parabolic ones will give you that perfect focal point. But um, if you had a five metre one that was parabolic and you stuck a chicken on a rotisserie, you'd probably just about burn a hole through it or catch it on fire or something, you know, it was, it'd be a little bit too much. But if you had a spherical one, which I'm intending to do, um, you know, it gives you a wider focal point um, and it isn't as hot. And you say, oh, yeah, but you want it as hot as you, you can get it. Yeah, but they're boiling kettles and cooking eggs off of what? Satellite dishes? Which is what, like, these ones I'm seeing are like, well, like one foot four or something like this, if even that, across. And I got what, 16 and almost 16 and a half foot? I think we're not going to have a problem if the focal point's a little bit too big. It's still going to be plenty warm, I think, uh, you know, because it's such a big dish. Um, now, with all this, you're going, oh, why are you building one so big? That's overkill. 
Yeah, it is. But then I can start desalinating the water that I've got in my dam slash ponds. Now, there was a video where I show this um, big one that I've got. I've actually got three. Uh, one's a little tiddler. The other one sort of medium size, and there's a couple of parts of that which are deep as deep. I mean, if you drive a car and the whole thing is you go right under and you'd be metres, even the, the back of the car would still be metres underwater because it's super deep, the medium one. Uh, and then I've got the big one, which is deep in areas, um, but the bank behind it is real big. So then it starts to fill up and there, there'll be an area where it looks like the damn thing looks like it's three quarters of an acre full. But a lot of that water is then only a few inches deep, down to a foot deep, and then all of a sudden you drop off to where it's dug and it's and just boff, she right in, you know, she's right over my head. Um, but yeah, all the same, that's a bit over a quarter of a mile away, about 500 metres away, um, and there is a water pump that needs fixing, or I could get a what's called a dirty water pump. Um, and take my little two-stroke generator down there and pump water from there up to this house, then desalinate it, and then I won't be going through so much water that I've got to pay for when I do my laundry because I'll use the desalinated water for um, my laundry because that's a real killer on water usage around here is that laundry. Now, you may say, oh, what, is it salty? No, it's not. It's bound to have a bit of bacteria in it because it's got a bit of algae and all the little diving beetles and all those little bugs in it and um, the ducks seem to hang around there a lot as well and um, there's always muddy you know it's never clear it's always sort of muddy um, but this is a thing desalination will remove it'll kill bacteria with the heat of it and it'll also remove all the mud now I want to set this up with posts on either side of it um, in a manner that I can basically just lay on whatever I want to put on there, whether it's something holding a pot, whether it's a rotisserie, or whether it's literally big long pipes and a small sort of drum thing in the middle or whatever, um, you know, to be able to pump water in and have it desalinate and disappear um, and recondense in an aluminium radiator, get a brand new one. Um, and yes, you know, it's not maybe terribly desirable to... Um, be going through an aluminium radiator with it, but I'm not drinking the stuff, so it doesn't really matter. But the water I do buy, I can keep for drinking and cooking um, and use the laundry on desalinated water and possibly the shower, because the way I got it set up with a document tub, I put another hole in there for a dipstick and then only use the dipstick like once or twice. And they've got this extra hole. It's a perfect size to put a half inch pipe into. And there we go, you know. Um, and so, you know, that's a that's a real possibility to be able to do that. I mean, in the heat transfer industry, cooling things down is not an issue. I have heaps of copper pipe here. I could literally do pin fin on copper pipe. There we go. Um, you know, but a couple of car radiators, new ones, um, you know, and a bit of a wind or some fans um, running off a little two-stroke generator or whatever, because I may need to also pump water up to the right height to be able to run it through for desalination. So I have a generator going anyway. Um, you know, that'll give me, um, you know, a little two-stroke doesn't take bugger all, but that'll give me, um, you know, um, desalinated water, uh, fresh water without having to leave this property and without having to build a big rainwater catchment set up just to have the local government tell me I've got to tear it down because it's over a metre high and I can't build anything without a permit that's more than a metre high and they've seen it from one of their helicopters, which is probably the only stupid helicopter that's flying over now for the umpteenth time. Um, so, you know, that's sort of, um, yeah, that's the way it is. Um, and, yeah, that's that's what I intend to go ahead and do. You know, I, I don't do things by halves. And quite frankly, this will put me into the top handful of people that own really big uh, solar dishes uh, another one I've seen, uh, it was a monster. It, it'd probably leave that behind. Um, oh, I was flipping tall. It was like seven metres tall, but it was actually a frame with a whole heap of mirrors, and you got to in, uh, adjust each mirror individually. Uh, so it wasn't really a dish. But, you know, this is a decent system. Now, let's talk about commercial applications. Commercial applications for this include 
desalination um, because there are some people in some areas who need to water cattle and sheep in the outback and stuff like that. Um, and the trouble with all this um, is that they can get water sometimes and it's fine and other times it's very hard to get water and other times they can get it and it's just as salty as buggery. Uh, well, they've got these you know, areas that are big salt lakes, that the huge salt lakes, and then they dry out for some time of the year. And, you know, and then they, like Lake Eyre, one of the biggest lakes in this country, half the time it didn't exist. It didn't exist for like two or three years. And more recently, <clears throat> when all the drought ended and all that, yeah, come back again. Um, and, you know, this, this lake is one of the biggest in the country, but it's not there most of the time because it's a salt lake that is literally way out in the desert, um, and it just sort of comes and goes, like a lot of these salt lakes do um, out in the desert. And there's some whoppers out there. Um, my parents seen one when they were near Cooper Pedy. And, um, you know, there's literally a train line there, and they used to get salt from it. And, yeah, use the salt for, well, selling salt. Um, now, with all this, you can go ahead and make a big, big system. Now, the one I'm doing here, I have worked out how to do it, not normally, but out of concrete. Yeah, concrete. And I have, or I'm going to put uh, wooden framing and then corrugated iron or sheet metal um, that's roughly a sort of spherical shape and probably actually more like a hexagonal shape. Um, and then fill the rest with concrete but be able to using my knowledge that I'm not going to go into in great detail uh, to be able to create a sphere in it let it set and then experiment with um, different glues and um, concrete to make sure I don't get the wrong glue and, and then have the whole lot fall off play around experiment a little bit and then go ahead and boom put reflective material on the inside and it's also going to need a little hole in the middle uh, to let the rainwater out. I forgot to mention that. I'm going to have mine sitting on the flat but I will be able to tilt it up on the angle if I put some sort of things under one side to tilt it up um, and I may make a bit of extra wood framing to be able to do that. Um, but you know it's not unrealistic. Uh, a lot of farmers, a lot of farmers around here including well, even including my uncle and his mates, and and uh, his mate was real good in that area. Um, you know, they've got earth moving equipment. Uh, no big deal. It's actually a lot of people have got earth moving equipment. Now these may be old bangers that you know need to be 1971 model that needs to be jump started and is a bit rough on it and takes a lot of fuel and takes a hell of a lot of engine oil. But they've got them, and some people have got ones that are damn good ones, like where I grew up as a kid in Western Australia. They went and bought one off a local government auction. Uh, they had an auction there or a tender. Oh, no, I think it was a tender. Anyway, they got this one from local government. Um, and it was a four-wheel drive Caterpillar articulated, fully enclosed cabin. I don't know if it didn't even have air conditioning in the whole lot and you could do some things with that toy. <laughs> he, went, he had a 44 or 55 gallon drum uh, full of bees of blooming had a hive in it. So, right, first thing we're doing is we're going to get in this, close all the flipping vents, close all the door, bang, all door seals. He went out there and he picked the damn thing up and took it out of the paddock because he was sick of it being right near the uh, the chook pen. His wife couldn't get the eggs without having getting worried about getting attacked by bees. Um, but, you know, this is the sort of stuff that farmers have around here. And, you know, it's not unrealistic for them to be able to dig their own dams as they do in Queensland. I've seen one, I'm not joking, this is like a pond that they were going to make when they were told that their water rights were going to be cut off or whatever. Um, they decided to make these ones. I'm not joking to say they were 30 acres, 40 acres or more. One big pond. And they run around with this earth move equipment they had and they'd made the walls for it right in about two weeks. And you think, crikey, like, you know, with stuff like this, these boys have got this sort of stuff. Hey, some of them have got the old bangers, you know, that are from the early 70s, even the late 60s. They need a jump start. You know, they take a lot of oil. But they're still capable 
of digging holes in sandy areas like the outback um, and making basically a great big parabola sort of a shape. You know, and it may need someone to come in with a, um, a roller, you know, to compact it all a bit. Um, you know, and or the other possibility is, uh, as they used to do in Western Australia, get the big blooming, uh, they used to make silage literally by rolling it over over it with this whopping big blooming four-wheel drive tractor that they bought secondhand from somebody in the wheat belt. And you don't know what tractors are until you've seen ones in the wheat belt. I mean, we're talking, you know, these things, they're, they're basically got 16 wheels. I mean, 16 full-size wheels for one tractor. Um, it's hard to believe until you see it. Um, but, you know, you get larger tractors and that, and you can roll stuff pretty flat with them purely out of their weight, um, you know. So between a front-end loader scraping it out and then a, a tractor or the same front-end loader, um, you know, with a bucket full of dirt or something, you know, you can compact it all, and then we can go ahead and do all the concrete. Now, this cost of this concrete, for me, is going to be... Pfft, I've probably, I know I've paid more at restaurants for lunch. That's not a joke. Um, there's times there where I've probably almost paid more for food at McDonald's when I got a big lunch a couple of times. Um, that's what it's going to cost me to build this one that's five metres across. It will also be a very low cost building large ones. Now, they can build ones that are literally one-eighth of a mile across or 200 metres across. With this stuff, you know, if I'd done it, the local government gets up your nose here, only recently has started getting up people's nose about building dams and needing permits or not permits, but permission to, you know, build a dam. And in the end, it's going to be full blown bloom and you've got to have a past and everything. That'll be the future, um, you know, because it's, yeah, this is just the way the local government is here. But up in Queensland, they couldn't stop them from building those ones that were 30 acres, 40 acres, 50 acres in size. They couldn't stop them from building those. There was nothing, no permits needed to build them. Um, and, you know, same thing. They could build one whopper that's 200 metres wide. You know, it, it's probably going to be a bit of a stretch for me to build any bigger than that. But, hey, you know, we'll see what we could do if they wanted one bigger. Um, but that should be big enough. And, you know, build... A whopper like that, um, you know, and this thing, you could probably stick two, what we call 44 British gallon drums, or Americans call 255 gallon drums, on some sort of framework and hang them out there at the focal point, and you could pump water in with three inch pipes. I mean, you could probably get two three inch pipes and pump water in, and it'd be going so hard, it'd be boiling it straight off with a focal point of a dish that is one eighth of a mile or 200 metres across. You know, and this is not an impossibility, and it would be surprisingly, shockingly cheap for me to do it. Not that I'm going to tell them because I want to make a profit, but the profits that are available would be astronomical. Um, now, as I have said, I can do it very cheap with this concrete method. Really cheap. I can actually do it parabolic just that I'm going to have to spend a bit of time at the university and my first one just to keep things simple and just to experiment, just for a start, I want to do a spherical one. Um, now, this helicopter is still here, um, but anyways, I want to talk about some of the ones I've seen on the internet. Now, there's one I've seen, right, and this is not a joke, it was like, what was it like? Oh, I don't know. Two, in, uh, two foot four or something across. Um, maybe only two foot. Yeah, two foot three, something like that. Um, and it was made in India for Indians to buy. Now, it was 2,500 rupee. That's equivalent to about US $55. Now, you've got to keep in mind that the Indians, many of them, um, yeah, they're sort of on Chinese sort of wages. Bangladesh is the preferred place to do clothing, or has been until they killed a thousand workers when the building collapsed. Flaming idiots, shonky buildings. Um, but anyway, those Bangladeshis um, and the factories there, they work for less than the Chinese workforce. So that's Bangladesh. Uh, now India 
you know, is around the same sort of wages as China or Bangladesh, which are both its neighbours. Um, and somehow they think that uh, these people who are, you know, getting a handful of dollars are, uh, got $55 to buy this, uh, you know, parabolic solar cooker. Um, and, you know, they probably have if they save for quite a while or whatever, um, you, you know, all the, the ones that aren't completely poor, you know, because there, there are some seriously, seriously wealthy people in India too, uh, which you may not know that, but there is. Um, so anyways, in this article on that and comparing other ones, uh, other parabolic solar cookers, um, they said that, uh, oh, you know, it's it's uh, super cheap and that's, you know, going to take the market by storm because it's, it's broken a price barrier and it's going to be available to some people. And I was looking at it, what? 55 US dollars? I'm thinking, you're joking, aren't you? I'm going to be able to build this one that's the size of my car, 16 foot 5 inches, 5 metres across for less than that. You know, and, and this thing's only, well, like, two foot three. You know, like, that <sighs> tells me that there's going to be quite a bit of money in, in what I'm doing. Uh, and the best thing about it all is it's current technology. It's not, oh, only homeless people live in a cardboard box when they see the, the cardboard house and stupid stuff like that. Um, you know, this is existing technology already, um, so it's not such a, a fear factor. But it is unique because they're not so common, um, you know, so people don't really know what price to gauge on these things. But if you can say the Indians are paying 55 US dollars um, for, you know, some piss fart one made in India, um, you know, I've got a benchmark to work on as what's the cheapest parabolic solar cooker that's available. Um, and this, that benchmark will really suit me well because I can do it way cheaper than that. Now, you know, and still make a good profit. Now, what I um, have seen otherwise is ones, I think it was a, a trough one. I don't know. It could have been an actual dish. Uh, sort of looked a bit like a trough one, but it was Indians were doing it. And as you may know, if you've had anything to do with India, all the buildings there, they go for brick over timber because there's been a lot of deforestation because of people burning firewood for cooking. Um, but there is an immense amount of clay there and bricks are always the way to go and they make their own bricks there um, and they had basically some of that clay and they said in, in this article it was mud um, but they were making a solar cooker of some kind or a solar you know, um, trough for water heating or whatever um, quite simply making it out of clay. And they said in the article they were making it out of mud. Um, now there's other ones that have been um, made, and this is another little interesting um, thing you may not know. The Russian military actually has parabolic solar cookers as one of the military issue items. How is that? Bet you didn't know that. Uh, they said it is very well thought out and designed, um, and, and yeah, they can spin it out and click it out, and I think it all folds up, Constantina's back into itself or something like that, uh, but you know, she's really high quality and very well properly thought out, um, you know, very well intelligently designed little thing, and she all just folds up neatly, um, and that's what the Russian military have. Um, but. I don't have a great deal more to... Uh, oh, yeah, I might as well say the other one. There was another one they used to have uh, way back, and I think I might have even seen photos of these. Um, inflatable ones. And it's like a... Well, it's like this big heap of plastic, like a deflated beach ball. And then you just blow it up like a beach ball, but it blows up into a parabolic solar cooker on one side, and the back's just like normal plastic or whatever. Um, like normal beach ball sort of stuff on the on the back or rubber or whatever. Um, but yeah, the, you got to sort of watch how you blow them up because apparently you can stuff up the focal point if you don't if you blow it up too much or too less or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's um, yeah, that's all I got to say really on it. I, I can't think of any other really intriguing examples, um, but I'm sure I'll come across a few. And uh, that's my next little project.